Hi everyone, my name is Matt Lair, and today we're going to talk about what it takes to build your own net con types in Go from the ground up. So to start, you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, pretty much everywhere else as at MDLayer. My website is mdlayer.com. It has lots of links to things I've worked on. And also check out my talks repository. That's where all the slides will be linked after this talk. I've also tweeted them out. I work for Fastly, and I'd like to thank Fastly for sponsoring my trip here to GopherCon UK. If you're interested, we use a lot of Go, please come talk to me afterward. So today we're going to talk about package net. And you can kind of think of package net as your fundamental building block for network clients and servers in Go. It provides some of the most commonly used socket types, such as TCP, UDP, IP, and Unix, and some high-level interfaces that abstract these away for you. So today we're going to focus on NetCon, which is a generic stream-oriented network connection, and NetListener, which is a generic network listener for stream-oriented protocols. There is also NetPacketCon. We're not going to focus on that today, but many of the same lessons actually apply. Well, what exactly is a stream-oriented connection anyway? So you can think of it as data flowing in a reliable in-order stream between two different network sockets. So for example, TCP sockets are considered stream-oriented. And the net TCP con and net TCP listener types also implement the net con and net listener interfaces. So for example, protocols such as HTTP, HTTPS, SSH all run on top of TCP because of this property. It's worth noting that UDP sockets are packet-oriented, and that's where net packet con comes in. So if you'd like to use a net con and go on the client side, for example, you would use the net dial constructor. In this case, we say we would like a TCP connection to golang.org port 80. Once we have this net con, we can actually write a raw HTTP request to the connection and read the results using this method. On the server side, if we'd like a server, we call net listen. We again specify TCP, and we're going to bind to all IP addresses on port 8080. From here, we begin a for loop, and we keep accepting connections and spinning them off into their own Go routines. But of course, these are not the only socket types out there. And while TCP and UDP are the most common and what you'll see over the internet, NetCon and NetListener provide us interfaces. So we can actually implement our own socket types as well. So this is where I'm going to introduce AF VSOC. So VSOC is short for Linux Virtual Machine Sockets. This is a fairly new socket family in the Linux kernel that enables bidirectional communication between a hypervisor and its hosted virtual machines. So you can think of this kind of like similar to a Unix socket, as in it doesn't leave the system at all, but it can cross over the hypervisor and virtual machine boundary, unlike a Unix socket. So the addresses in VSOC contain a context ID and port pair, and this is very similar to your IP address and port in TCP IP stack. So VSOC looks something like this conceptually. You have the Linux kernel in the middle running on this hypervisor, and you have this process, let's call it hypervisor D, running on the host. This has a context ID of two, so the host always gets a context ID of two in VSOC. Each of the virtual machines is assigned a context ID as well, in this case, three, four, and five. And your QMU processes all are running different virtual machines, and they have this virtual vert.io VSOC device. This actually enables VSOC transport between the Linux kernel on the host and the virtual machine guest as well. So you have this agent process that's able to actually dial a VSOC connection and reach out to the hypervisor process in each of these virtual machines. So if you'd like to use VSOC and Go, I've actually done a lot of the hard work for you, and you can check out my VSOC package. So this actually provides the package net types that we're going to discuss today to actually use VM sockets in Go. And it's already used in a couple of interesting open source projects, such as Firecracker Container D and the Kata Containers Agent. So for example, if we'd like to revisit our previous example with a network client and server, we can actually use the VSOC types in place. So instead of calling net dial, we now call VSOC dial. We dial a connection to the host, which is the hypervisor on port 8080. And we can actually issue a raw HTTP request over VSOC to the hypervisor using the same methods. On the server side, we swap out the call to netslisten with a call to VSOC listen on port 8080 as well. From here, we begin looping and accepting connections and spin them off on their own Go routines. But of course, how do we actually implement this in Go? What does it take to make this happen? So this is where we need to start discussing the BSD sockets API. This is a set of system calls which are used to manipulate network sockets on Unix-like operating systems such as Linux. So in this case, some of the most common ones include socket, send, and receive. And the two indicates that you can find them in section two of the manual pages. So if you type man2 socket in your terminal, you can actually view the documentation for these in C. It's important to note that on Linux, PackageNet is actually using these system calls internally for you, but you don't have to really care or know about them. I highly recommend checking out Beej's Guide to Network Programming. This is a really great guide to learning BSD sockets, and this is actually how I learned to use BSD sockets in the first place in C. And although the examples are in C, they apply very well to Go because we have the syscall and xsys packages, which also enable raw access to these system calls. So if we'd like to map the package net APIs to BSD sockets, we have to understand a variety of different system calls for both netcon and netlistener. 
So let's start first by building our own netcon type from the ground up. We need to also discuss how the netcon and net adder interfaces work in order to understand. So netcon, again, is your generic stream-oriented network connection. It has some of the methods you might be familiar with, such as read, write, and close, which are some, some of the I.O. interfaces in Go. But it also has methods to retrieve the local and remote address. And the net adder type is also an interface. So for example, a TCP connection will return TCP addresses, or a VSOC connection will return VSOC addresses. There are also a set of methods for setting deadlines on the type, so you can actually use timeouts as well. So here's an example of some initial implementations of our net adder and net con types. We create this adder structure. It has a context ID and port pair, because that's the addresses for VSOC. There are a couple of methods here that are basically one line to implement the interface, but I've chosen to omit them in for brevity. So now we're also going to create our con structure. So what I like to do when working with system calls and OS-specific code is have an exported type, for example, con, that has all of my documentation. Internally, I have this OS-specific implementation of con with a lowercase c. And this lives behind build tags. Because whenever you're using system calls in Go, you need to make sure you use build tags. Because for example, the VSOC APIs are not implemented on other platforms other than Linux. So this con type will be fully implemented on Linux behind a build tag. But on other platforms, we have a series of shims that will always return errors. So our code can continue to compile, but it just won't work elsewhere. Next, we'll create the constructor for our client side, which is VSOC dial. This will dial out a VM sockets connection. And we're going to use system calls today from the xsys Unix package instead of syscall. Uh, syscall has been deprecated for quite some time, and xsys still sees some active development. And you can actually take C headers and generate Go types, which is how I was able to add VSOC support to the xsys Unix package. It's certainly an interesting topic, but one we can't really discuss today. We just don't have enough time. So again, we're going to call into more OS-specific code, again, with a lowercase d dial. And this lives behind a build tag. So the first system call we have to discuss is socket. So socket is going to be passed a variety of parameters that configure a socket and create a new file descriptor that refers to that socket within the kernel. So we specify AF vsoc because we'd like to make vsoc connections. We specify sock stream because we're going for a stream-oriented socket. And we also specify close on exec, which means that if we fork a child process, it will not inherit the file descriptor opened here. So we specify these, and now we have this file descriptor integer that we can use for the rest of our system calls. On the client side, the next step is connect. So we create this Unix sock adder VM structure that implements a sock adder interface defined by xsys. And we actually populate it with the context ID and port appropriately of the remote machine we're trying to connect to, or the virtual machine. Once we issue connect, we can then issue get sock name. And this allows us to get the local address of our socket. This is, again, in the Unix sock adder structure. So we take that interface and do a type assertion to the sock adder VM type and unpack that into our high level structure so we can return this as part of our API. Finally, we call OS new file. Because we have this raw file descriptor that's just an integer, we want to actually wrap it up in an OS file type for convenience. In this case, because OS file has methods such as read, write, and close, we can directly use those in our type without actually having to do more system calls for this specific type. So now that we've done that, we essentially have our initial netcon type. We're going to mostly rely on the methods of OS file for this, but deadlines are not yet implemented. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Now that we've created our initial netcon, let's talk about what it takes to create a net listener. The listener interface is a bit smaller. So there's accept, which produces another netcon. So for example, a TCP listener will produce TCP connections, and a VSOC listener should produce VSOC connections. There's also close. So it's important to note that if you run accept and call close in a different Go routine, it should be able to unblock the call to accept as well. There's also adder, which returns the local address, which again is going to be a VSOC address for a VSOC listener. For our listener structure, we're going to follow the same pattern. We have an exported type called listener, which has all of our documentation, and an unexported type that lives behind build tags. We also create our listen constructor and allow the caller to specify a port. We can actually infer the context ID ourselves without having the caller do it for us. And in order to do that, we can use the ioctl or ioctl system call. So what this basically does is it tells the kernel to populate some region of memory that we pass to it with a pointer and give us a, a value back. So we're opening a handle to the dev vsoc file, we call this ioctl git un32 helper and specify that we'd like to get the local context ID of our socket. And now our caller doesn't have to care about the context ID because we can always infer it on their behalf. So now we also call socket. It's actually the exact same setup as we did before on the client side for the server side as well, the same flags and everything. But instead of calling connect, because we are a server, we now have to invoke bind. So bind will specify the context ID of our host and the port we would like to bind to. And once we issue bind, we can begin listening for incoming connections. 
We call Unix listen with the file descriptor that we have, and we tell the kernel to enqueue the maximum number of possible connections using so maxcon. Now that we have that, we can also get the local address of our socket, so that way we are able to return it as part of our listener. This is where things get a little more interesting as well. So now we have to implement our accept method. So we're going to use the accept for system call. There is also an accept system call, but accept for accepts flags. You'll find this is a pretty common pattern with the Unix kernel, or the Linux kernel. So once we call accept for, we will retrieve a raw file descriptor. And since we need to return a netcon, we have to do some of the same process as we did before to take that raw file descriptor and package it up within the netcon interface. So we can do that by, again, using OS new file. We take that file descriptor, package it up in OS file, unpack the socket address into our address structure. So here is our initial listener type. We're using just a few system calls to make this happen. We also use Unix close here to actually close the file descriptor of the listener. And then again, we're calling accept for to accept and produce new netcon or vsocon implementations. So now we've got our initial code, but there are a couple of problems with our implementations that we need to solve. So the netcon interface has some kind of subtleties to it, the foremost of which is that multiple Go routines may invoke methods on a con simultaneously. So what this means is that if you call read or write and another Go routine calls close, it should be able to unblock that call to read or write. And in our, our current code, that actually does not work. And it's also worth noting that we must implement the deadline methods properly. And also, there's this third interface I haven't talked about called net error. So net error defines if an error is related to something like a temporary or timeout or permanent error. And the net op error type in the net package can actually be used to implement this interface. But what we have to do is unpack our system call errors in such in a certain way to comply with this interface as well. The net listener interface actually shares many of the same subtleties. So if you're calling accept and a different Go routine calls close, we must be able to unblock the call to accept. And it's also worth noting that some of the standard library implementations support a set deadline method, which could be quite handy. So why can't we? We also have to make sure we satisfy the net error interface in the same way. So this is where we introduce one of my favorite features of Go, and that is the runtime network polar. But in order to understand the runtime network polar, we also have to understand non-blocking I.O. So what this means is that when you're doing a non-blocking I.O. call, system calls which would normally block if data is not ready will return immediately with the E again system call error. So what we could do is create a loop and keep reading over and over again. But there's a problem. This could create a potentially inefficient busy loop as you do repeated system calls to check for readiness. So a solution to this problem is to use some kind of I.O. event notification mechanism, such as Linux's ePoll framework and series of system calls. And in order to use non-blocking I.O., we're going to use the Unix set non-block function to actually set our file descriptors to the non-blocking mode. And this is where we can start to talk about the runtime network polar. It's a bunch of code implemented in the runtime and internal poll package. And as it turns out, it actually uses some of these OS-specific event notification mechanisms for you, such as ePoll, KQ, or IOCP. And in my opinion, this is one of Go's absolute best of features, because it enables efficient OS thread utilization by parking and unparking Go routines efficiently when they have I.O. or when they're ready to work. But how exactly does the runtime network polar work? So let's say, for example, we have a Go routine that is calling into a netcon read method and also setting an associated deadline. This call from net will be passed into internal poll. Internal poll will see this and split it into two different locations. So we call into the runtime, and we see this poll set deadline function. This is going to result in the creation of a runtime timer, which is a special structure managed by the runtime that can deal with high resolution timers. So say, for example, we set a timer for five seconds. We also call into the syscall package, but we're using non-blocking I.O. So we will invoke a syscall read directly and see what happens. Within the internal poll FD type, the read method looks something like this. It's going to attempt a read using non-blocking I.O. So we invoke syscall read. And if the read completed without E again, that is no error or any other error at all, we're going to possibly unpack the error and return it to the caller. We're all done. However, if the read saw E again, that means our data is not ready and we must wait for readiness. And the runtime network polar can actually do this on your behalf. So what this means is that control is going to return to you, the caller, whenever your I.O. actually completes, either successfully or with an error, or the timer expires that you set in the runtime. So what the runtime network polar does is it enables you to use non-blocking I.O. that appears to be blocking I.O. from your calling perspective. And this also means that system calls can block a single Go routine and park that Go routine instead of blocking an entire OS thread. And this is the secret sauce that makes concurrent calls to netcon types possible. So the built-in netcon types in Go are automatically going to use the runtime network polar. But what about our custom type? 
as it turns out, it took quite a bit of work for us to be able to access the runtime network polar from the outside with different socket types. So roughly in 2015, there was some initial discussion on how to add different socket types to the polar, such as Netlink sockets. In Go 1.9, we gained the SysCallCon and SysCallRawCon interfaces that provide us low-level hooks into these high-level types. In Go 1.10, the OS file type gained the set deadline family of methods, so we can call into the polar from the OS file. In Go 1.11, OS new file will now register any non-blocking file descriptors with the runtime network polar. And finally, in GoS 112, the OS file method or type gained the syscallcon method, which enables us to perform some of those same system calls on that high-level file type. So this is the syscall rawcon interface, and it provides raw, control, read, and write methods that you can use to access the raw file descriptor of a type. So what this allows you to do is take your high-level type and do something like set a socket option, which might be a very OS-specific thing, on your high-level types. But the read and write methods here are really interesting because they return a Boolean. And this means that we can actually use these to indicate whether or not we are complete to the runtime network polar. So now let's talk about what it takes to integrate our vsockcon type with the runtime network polar. The first step is to take that file descriptor we had before, which was set to blocking mode and created by the socket system call, and set it to non-blocking mode. Now that we use OS new file in this case, it will be registered with the runtime network polar. And because the file method now, or the file type now has the set deadline family of methods, we can actually use the OS file to back most of the methods in this type. It's important to note that while this works fine for netcon, in netpacketcon, this actually does not work because it doesn't have read and write methods within that interface. So you have to actually use the syscallcon methods I will discuss shortly. And if you want to actually test your netcon for compliance and make sure that you comply with all the guarantees of the standard library in that interface, you can use the xnet nettest package. So nettest testcon will actually take this function that produces a local pipe. So I've created a helper here that creates a net listener and a net con and ties them together. And test con will run a series of tests using those two together to verify that you implement all the behaviors appropriately. So we also need to be able to make sure that we implement the net error interface. And net test and your callers want to be able to check if something is related to a temporary or timeout error. So unfortunately, this is kind of a non-trivial process. It involves unwrapping system call errors in various ways, uh, doing things like turning some system call errors into IOEOF, or indicating timeouts using the runtime network polar as well. It's achievable through some trial and error. So I've linked the code here, but what it mostly comes down to is calling out, and every time you see an error, make sure you produce some kind of net op error and unpack it appropriately. So you can check out that link if you're interested to see how I did this in my type. So now that we've discussed how to actually set up our netcon, let's talk about how we set up our vsock listener type. So again, we have a blocking file descriptor. We set it to the non-blocking mode, and we register it with the runtime network polar by calling OS new file. But now, this is where things get a little more interesting. We're going to use the OS file's syscallcon API. And it's worth noting this is only available in Go 112 Plus. So Go 112 gave us, gave us the final pieces we needed to really make this all work. So you can do this with some older versions of Go using some pretty interesting things like repeating in a loop the accept calls, but I really might recommend using Go 112. It's going to make your life a lot easier. So when we invoke syscallcon, we get access to the raw connection behind our listener. And now we can set up a raw read to perform a non-blocking version of the accept for system call. We're going to return a new file descriptor, which is the accepted file descriptor, and the socket address of where it came from. So we create these variables and pass them into this closure here. Within the closure itself, we invoke the accept for system call. And the raw read is going to pass us the file descriptor we need to use. We also pass the flags we'd like to specify. And we call accept for. So we check the error here. And if we see E again or E con aborted, then we know that we are not ready and we must let the polar continue to wait for readiness. And we return false. For no error at all or any other unrecognized error, we're all done. And we return true so that way control will eventually return to your caller. In order to test for NetListener compliance, there's also going to be a NetTest API for doing this, but it's not merged quite yet. Unfortunately, the same caveats also apply about implementing the net error interface. You have to essentially wrap everything with the net op error type if any kind of error occurs. So putting this all together, what can you actually use these two types for? Let's say, for example, we'd like to serve HTTP over vSOC instead of over TCP. So while HTTP normally does run over TCP, there is no limitation in the Go standard library that prevents us from running it over different types. So for example here, we'll invoke vsock listen and create our net listener. And the first parameter to HTTP serve is actually a net listener. So we'll pass the vsock listener in case 
or instead of a typical TCP listener. And then we can serve the files from the current directory as well. On our client side, the HTTP transport type has this dial hook. You can actually use this to dial out an arbitrary netcon type to use for your client. So we're going to pass an address string. It's going to contain a context ID and port pair separated by a colon. We split these in two and eventually convert them to integers and call out to vsock dial. So now that we have this dial hook, we put the transport within an HTTP client, and we can invoke methods on the client to actually work over vSOC. So putting this together, on my hypervisor, I run the server on port 8080, and on the client, I issue an HTTP request over vSOC to my context ID of 2, which is the hypervisor, port 8080, and fetch the contents of hello.txt. It's also worth noting there appears to be another way to do this by registering a new, for example, vSOC protocol scheme. I didn't look into that as much, but that's another thing that can totally work. But of course, we're not just limited to HTTP. We can use our interfaces anywhere that NetCon and NetListener will work. So how about gRPC? So let's do the gRPC Go Hello World demo, but using vSOC instead of TCP. So the first step for gRPC is to make a server type that implements the interface generated by the gRPC code. So in this case, we have this greeter server interface, and we're going to create this hello server type. It has this say hello RPC that implements the interface. It accepts a request with a name, and we're going to return a reply that says hello to whoever is speaking to us. So now we create a vSOC listener again, and we can begin creating a gRPC server, register our new type that implements the interface with the gRPC server, and then begin serving connections over our vSOC listener instead of over TCP. On the client side, it's actually fairly similar to the HTTP transport. We're going to dial a raw gRPC connection, but it's going to use vSOC as its transport instead of TCP. We go through the same process of taking the address, splitting it, and calling vSOC dial. It's worth noting in this case, I've chose to specify with insecure, because although I could set up TLS in this case, uh, doing all the extra certificate work is probably not worth it for a demo. But of course, if you're doing this in a real application, you should use TLS. So now that we have that gRPC client connection, we can actually wrap it in the greeter client type and begin invoking RPCs. So we'll call the say hello RPC, and we'll say hello to all of you at GopherCon UK, and we'll print the message to the screen. Running the server on my hypervisor and then running the client on my virtual machine, you will see that we've successfully done gRPC over vSOC. So in summary, the possibilities for this thing really are kind of endless. And implementing some of the standard interfaces in the Go standard library can provide you a great amount of flexibility in your own applications. So in the case of vSOC, you can imagine some pretty interesting use cases. And a couple I've listed here that I thought of could be something like a virtual machine guest agent that communicates to a hypervisor over gRPC as some service for a cloud provider, like your metadata service, for example. Or you could also think of perhaps having a virtual machine that doesn't actually have a virtual network interface, but it can communicate with a local proxy using HTTP, and then the proxy proxies vSOC out to the hypervisor, and suddenly you have access to the outside world without having a true network interface. So if you're interested in this topic, I wrote a blog a couple of years ago called Linux VM Sockets and Go. It might be slightly out of date, but it could be worth a read. You're more than welcome to check out the source code, my vSOC package on GitHub. And also, I'd like to say thanks to ACLN and many of the other folks on the networking channel on Gopher Slack. It's a really great group. Uh, come talk to us. We're definitely all very friendly, and we love working on these kinds of problems. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for your time.